So welcome everybody to our webinar on the subject of mixing of viscous fluids and particularly fluids with non-Newtonian properties. So without more ado, let's get going. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about myself. My name is Richard Grenville. I'm a principal engineer at uh, SPX Flows Mixing Solutions business. Um, I have 40 years of experience, nearly 40 years of experience in the field of mixing, including 22 years at DuPont in the corporate engineering department, and nine years with uh, Philadelphia Mixing Solutions, who were acquired by SPX Flow about 18 months ago. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor at Rowan University in New Jersey and at the University of Delaware, where I co-teach uh, a mixing course. Uh, it's a senior elective in the chemical engineering department. Um, I'm a chartered engineer, which is the um, UK equivalent of uh, being a professional engineer. And I'm a member of the Institution of Chemical Engineers and the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. And I'm a former president of the North American Mixing Forum and the winner of their NAMP Award in, in 2017. So I'd also like to say a few words about our our business. Um, SPX Flow Mixing Solutions is a worldwide organization. We have five brands under our corporate umbrella and they're Lightning, Philadelphia, Plenty, Steltzer and New Technic. And these brands represent a wide range of mixing applications across the process industry, including minerals and mining, biotechnology, paints and coatings, as well as nutrition and health. Uh, we have four labs in two in the US, one in China, and one in Europe, in Germany, where we're doing fundamental research to develop new mixing technologies and to carry out targeted research for customers to help them improve their processes. I'd also like to say, I mean, if you have any questions, please type them into the question and answer section, um, and we'll answer them at the end of the, of the webinar. So, um, as I say, if you have any questions, we'll get to them at the end. So here's the agenda. What is mixing? Uh, what is mixing? Um, what is viscosity? So how do we define it? How do we measure it? And what's the dif difference between a Newtonian and a non-Newtonian fluid? Then we're going to look at a process that um, demonstrates uh, the effect of viscosity, and that's blending of miscible liquids in, um, in the lamina transitional and turbulent regimes. Then we're going to look at mixing properties that we particularly need to focus on. The first is power drawn in the lamina regime. So in the same way that the friction factor in pipe flow is a function of Reynolds number, the power drawn by an impeller in a stirred tank is also a function of Reynolds number. And then we're going to look at blend time in the transitional and lamina regime. How does viscosity affect that? Then we're going to look at a special case of um, non-Newtonian behavior, and that's fluids with a yield stress, quite common in many process industries. And then we're going to look at some impellers that we, Philadelphia and Lightning sell, counterflow impellers, which are very um, successful in mixing of viscous and non-Newtonian fluids. And then we'll end with some conclusions. So what is mixing? So the definition I like was proposed by a gentleman called Art Etchels. Art was retired from DuPont in about two, the year 2000 as a DuPont fellow, the highest technical level that uh, you can get to in the DuPont Corporation. Uh, he's been consulting ever since. And he and I, uh, two of the, uh, the co-teachers at the University of Delaware and Rowan University uh, mixing course. So mixing is the application of mechanical motion in order to create fluid dynamic effects which achieve a desired process result. So starting from the bottom of this list, the desired process result is what you, the end user of the equipment, want to achieve. So you may have a chemical reaction. You might be dispersing an emissible phase. It could be a liquid-liquid system or a gas-liquid system. You could be wanting to promote mass transfer or heat transfer, dissolving solids, making solids through precipitation or crystallization, blending additives. Uh, you may want to prevent fouling in a polymerization reactor or a crystallizer. It may simply be a storage tank where you want to maintain uniformity of a chemical 
stored in that tank before it's sent into um, uh, downstream processors. And as we think about, we'll talk in more detail about your processors, what else is going on? Does the level change? Is it batch or continuous? Does the, what if, if the level does change, what's the minimum level? What's the maximum level? And we could probably spend half an hour adding to this list of all the things that we need to be concerned about when we think about the desired process result. But from a mixing point of view, there are two ways in which an impeller can add energy to the system. The first is the mean flow velocity, the, the mean kinetic energy, thinking of the impeller as a pump. And the second is shear. We're generating forces to disrupt a second phase, to break up droplets, to break up bubbles, to deagglomerate solids, or even in the extreme case, to break down crystals if we're doing milling and grinding. So having talked about the desired process result and identified what type, uh, what fluid dynamic effects we need in order to achieve that result, we can then make a selection of the impeller type, the geometry, by which I mean its, its diameter relative to the tank diameter, how many impellers on the shaft, what blade angles, uh, and um, how many blades see, and also the operating speed. And once we've got the impeller type, the number of impellers and the speed, we can calculate the power required to spin the mixer and the torque on the shaft, which determines the size of the gearbox, the shaft diameter, and the blade thickness, the, the mechanical aspects of, of the agitator design. So let's take a step back and talk about something a bit more fundamental. What viscosity, what is it? So this is the definition from Wikipedia. Uh, the viscosity of a fluid is a measure of its resistance to gradual deformation by shear stress or tensile stress. And for liquids, it corresponds to the informal concept of thickness. For example, honey is, has a much higher viscosity than water. It's thicker than water. And water has a much higher viscosity than air. So what does this mean? We're engineers. How do we measure it? What are the units? And we'll talk about how we use those measurements to size equipment. So defining viscosity, uh, this is, if you've studied fluid mechanics, this is a classic sketch that you'll see in your fluid mechanics book. Um, we have two plates of area A separated by a gap Y. We apply a force to the upper plate and it accelerates until it's traveling at a constant velocity V. So the shear stress that we're applying to the fluid is that force divided by the area. And the shear rate is the velocity gradient. And by definition, the dynamic viscosity of a fluid is the shear stress divided by the shear rate. So this is a fairly impractical um, geometry in which to try and measure viscosity. How do we do it in our lab? We use a device called a Kuwait viscometer. So we have a stationary cup and we have a bob which spins. So the, we choose the bob, the shape, the shape and the size of the bob, depending on the viscosity of the fluid, the, the, let the, the torque that we expect to measure on the shaft. And the force or the torque on the shaft gives us a measure of the shear stress. The shear rate is the velocity at the, at the edge of the bob divided by the gap. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure the stress over a, range, over a range of rotational speeds and velocities and plot the shear stress versus the shear rate over that range of speeds. So there are other devices that we can use to measure viscosity. A very common device is a, is a capillary viscometer. So we have a narrow tube we pump our fluid down the tube over a range of um, uh, flow rates. The velocity changes, the shear rate changes, and we can relate the pressure drop over those over that range of velocities to the viscosity of the fluid. Um, as I said, we use the Kuwait viscometer in our lab, and this is a picture. We use a Brookfield RST. Here are the cups, different internal diameters and here are the bobs and as I said you choose the appropriate bob and the appropriate cup for the 
to, to account for the, vis the viscosity that you're expecting to measure. So this device is computer controlled. We can increase and decrease the, the speed of the bob or the rotational speed automatically. The, the, this also feeds the data to the computer where it's recorded and analyzed. And our particular viscometer actually has a jacketed, uh, a jacketed cup. So you can change the temperature of many fluids. The viscosity is a strong function of temperature. So this is the uh, device that we use in our lab. We use it a lot. It's a very useful piece of equipment, as I, and I'll show you some measurements that we've made with it. So we're going to make some measurements of torque, which gives us the shear stress, and rotational speed, which gives us the shear rate. So we're engineers. We want to do calculations. So what we're going to do is take those measurements and fit them to equations which describe the relationship between the shear stress and the shear rate. And the simplest one is called the power law. So the shear stress is equal to a constant K multiplied by the shear rate raised to the power N. And the apparent viscosity, and we say apparent viscosity because it's the viscosity at the shear rate, is equal to the constant K to the shear rate N minus one. We're dividing through by the shear rate. So these two terms we measure, the K is the consistency and it describes the thickness of the fluid. And N describes the curvature or the degree of non-Newtonianness that we're measuring. So if N is less than one, we have a shear thinning fluid. So looking back up to this equation, N minus one is negative. The shear rate goes up, viscosity goes down. If N is equal to one, the exponent zero, and K is the dynamic Newtonian viscosity of the fluid. And if n is greater than one, that exponent's positive, and we have a shear thickening fluid. So let's look at some data. These are samples that we've we've measured and just used for um, like the, these teaching purposes. So this is a Newtonian fluid. Most sugar solutions are Newtonian corn syrup. So we have a linear relationship between the shear stress and the shear rate. And so what we do in our viscometer is we accelerate the um, bob and then we slow it down and we're looking for hysteresis. And I'll show you an example with hysteresis in a minute. So this is the shear stress versus shear rate. This is the apparent viscosity. The N is 0.997, so essentially it's one. K is 20.7. So the viscosity of this fluid is a Newtonian 20,700 centipoles. This is mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is non-Newtonian, it's shear thinning. So when we look at the shear stress shear rate curve, if it curves downwards, that's the shear thinning fluid. And if we look at the viscosity at one reciprocal second, the viscosity is about 120,000 centipoles. At 10 reciprocal seconds, it's, it's about 20,000. Uh, N is 0 .1, 0 0.1, let's call it 0.2, very, a lot less than one. So the smaller that number between one and zero, the more shear thinning the fluid is, or more shear thinning fluid behavior it exhibits. This is ketchup, which does exhibit hysteresis. So the red diamonds, we're accelerating the bob, the blue diamonds, we're slowing it down. So what do we know about ketchup? If I take the lid off a bottle and I turn it upside down, it doesn't flow. So I put the lid back on, I shake it, take the lid off and it will flow. So a lot of fluids build structure, especially if they're, if they're slurries. They're, they're weak forces, attracted forces between the solids that are held in the slurry, which increase the amount of force required to move the fluid. So each of these little jumps in, in the up curve are places where some structure has been broken. And as we come back down again, the curve is much smoother. Again, it's quite shear thinning. The N is 0.3. Um, and one of the properties of food, uh, of shampoo, uh, personal products like shampoo, uh, um, creams, body wash, is the feel. If, if for food, it's the feel in the mouth. For um, soaps, I guess it's the, and shampoos, the feel in our hands. But these properties are built into the product by the formulators who develop the recipes. So 
if that's what is needed, we need to see this curve so that we can size a piece of equipment accordingly to make it work. Um, the other question then is, will the mixer stop? Will, it, will the fluid be stationary for long enough to, to build this structure? In, in, as part of the process result discussion, we need to know that in order to size our equipment appropriately. So the final example of a non-Newtonian fluid is cornstarch, which is shear thickening. Now we're curving upwards. The N is 2.5. And so N minus 1 is 1.5. So the question is, well, how should we design an agitator? If high shear increases the viscosity, should we choose an impeller that, that's low shear? But the important thing, we need to, if we, we need this data, we need this rheological data, we can measure it in our lab. Often customers have the viscometers they need to um, make these measurements and supply the constants to the power law to us to use for impeller or agitator design. The other important message to take away here is that these curves are fits of, of uh, uh, a curve to um, the data. They really have no physical basis. So it, you have to be careful extrapolating. So the shear rates that we expect to see in a stirred tank are between zero and 100 reciprocal seconds. If you look at the shear rates in pipe flow, they hundreds of seconds, maybe an order of magnitude higher. And if you're spraying paint through a, a, a nozzle onto a, a car, say, the shear rates can be thousands of reciprocal seconds. So you need to make sure that you make these measurements over the range of shear rates that you expect to experience or your product to experience as it's being processed. So it's always very dangerous to extrapolate. Sometimes Often we see curves that are measured at higher shear rates and we ex have to extrapolate downwards, but it's always a, always dangerous to do that. So we've got mixing in low viscosity in the in the turbulent regime. So this is this is mixing with a uh, water-like fluid. Sorry, let me start that again. The impeller is uh, a hydrofoil. It looks a bit like a boat pro propeller. It's called medium solidity. A uh, tank is uh, two feet in diameter. The impeller is about six and a half, seven inches in diameter. And we're going to add tracer. And you'll see that it gets pulled down very quickly to the impeller and very quickly dispersed throughout the liquid. And in a well-designed turbulent mixing application that the blend time is going to be the order of tens of seconds, even in a large scale vessel, uh, the order of tens of seconds. This is the same impeller. Um, well, no, it's a different, it's a hydrofoil, but it's a narrow blade hydrofoil. Smaller tank, uh, smaller impeller, higher speed. But what you can see is that there are regions in the tank where there's very little motion. We have a, a zone around the impeller that's moving, that's well mixed. And really what we need to do in order to make operate our process successfully is to have motion throughout, throughout the vessel. And that's going to be our design, our, the goal of our agitator design. So when we measure blend time, we do experiments, we measure blend time. The classic way to present the data is as a dimensionless blend time, which is the product of the mixer speed N and the blend time theta, and plot that versus the impeller Reynolds number. So this is data from a paper by Hogan Dorn and Dan Hartog, Chemical Engineering Science, 1967. Um, so everyone who's done work since that, before and since then since that time, find the same kind of results. So in the turbulent regime, high Reynolds numbers, so for in turbines, we're looking at the mid to high thousands, between say three and 10,000. The dimensionless mixing time is constant and the power number, which is essentially a drag coefficient, dependent on the shape of the blades, 
is a constant. In the transitional regime, which for in stirred tanks is, say, from a, a Reynolds number of, of a few thousand down to about 100 or 200, the dimensionless mixing time is inversely proportional to Reynolds number, which means it's proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. And again, the power number is more or less constant. When we get down into the laminar regime, power number is inversely proportional to Reynolds number. So the power is proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. Now the dimensionless mixing time is, is it takes off. The exponent from Hogan Dawn and then Hartog's work is minus 10. The blending process becomes much more sensitive to the viscosity of the fluid. So what's happening? When turbines and hydrofoils operate in a low viscosity fluid, they generate a periodic jet, which is shown in the a movie on the right. So this is data measured with a device called a laser Doppler anemometer. And the, the, um, the scan is down this red line, and we're measuring the velocity at different points along the radius of the impeller. So as the impeller passes, there's a pulse in, in the velocity. As the viscosity increases, the jet's ability to entrain the surrounding fluid decreases. And you get to a point where the impeller is simply digging a hole for itself and no pumping occurs. The mixer turns, it's drawing power, but it's not pumping fluid around the tank. So in the same way that you have to make a decision whether to use a centrifugal pump or a positive displacement pump, we have to make the same decision when we're looking at the Reynolds number and the viscosity of our fluid in a stirred tank. So the, 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 the classic impeller to use under these um, circumstances it is a helical ribbon. And the reason we like a helical ribbon is because it generates axial flow. The, the, the alternative to this would be an anchor with vertical blades. And all it's going to do is make the liquid basically swirl with solid body rotation with very little top to bottom motion. So this is a classic double helical ribbon. The dimensional ratios are shown over here. Uh, this is the uh, what those letters represent. The pitch of the impeller is the height or the vertical distance that you would fall traveling 360 degrees around the um, around the ribbon. So this is the classic impeller typically used. So why do we use it? So the reason it gets commonly used is because in the laminar regime, the dimensionless mixing time is a constant. The, the power number, which is this drag coefficient, is inversely proportional to Reynolds number, proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. And there's a constant of proportionality, which is dependent on the geometry of the impeller. So one question and one of the things we've thought about in the past is, well, which what type of helical ribbon would be most energy efficient, uh, which would give us the lowest power to achieve a desired blend time? And the reason this is important is heat transfer between viscous fluids and uh, the wall of the tank cooling is usually poor. So the more energy I put in with my agitator, the more work my cooling system is going to have to do to remove that heat. So this is something that we've studied. I'm not going to talk about it uh, today, but if you're interested, uh, please feel free to get in touch with me or, or ask a question in, in, the, in the chat box. So the rules and correlations that we've discussed so far, the relationship between the dimensionless mixing time and Reynolds number for the helical ribbons and the turbines applied to Newtonian fluids. But most viscous fluids that we uh, handled in industry are non-Newtonian. So what we need to do is to look at the rules that we've developed for Newtonian fluids and work out how they can be modified to account for the fluid's non-Newtonian behavior. So we've reviewed what non-Newtonian behavior is. We've reviewed what viscosity is. How are we going to use that knowledge to um, deal with system situations where the, the process is dependent on the viscosity of the fluid. 
So there are, there are two calculations that require accurate, accurate knowledge of the fluid rheology. And the first is the power drawn by an impeller operating in the laminar regime, which we've already mentioned. So this is analogous to pressure drop in laminar pipe flow. The pressure drop is proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. So what we want to know is what viscosity does the impeller feel as it moves through the fluid? And in order to calculate that, we need to know what the shear rate is being generated at the impeller. And the second is the blend time in the transition of the laminar regimes. Where is the last region in the vessel to become mixed? What is the shear rate here? And what is the controlling viscosity? So let's talk about power first. So the power drawn by an impeller is calculated from this impeller, this equation, P is the power, PO is the power number of this drag coefficient, rho is the density of the fluid, N is the speed, rotational speed, and D is the diameter of the impeller. So PO is the impeller's power number, related to the geometry of the impeller. So in the turbulent regime, power number is constant, as friction factor is in pipe flow, in the laminar regime, power numbers inversely proportional to Reynolds number. It's a constant of proportionality, but the power is proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. So this is the power number versus Reynolds number uh, chart, uh, curve taken from a paper by Henry Rushton, 1950. And again, it's one of those things where nothing has changed. The, the geometry of impellers cha has changed but the general shape of this curve hasn't changed. We, we've got power number inversely proportional to Reynolds number in the laminar regime, power numbers are constant in the turbulent regime, and what happens in the transitional regime in between is de dependent on the geometry of the impeller. So power draw in the laminar regime, we need to estimate the shear rate at the impeller in order to estimate the apparent viscosity for non newtonian fluids estimate the power drawn by the impeller and as i've said already what we need to know is the viscosity that the impeller feels so the method developed to do this was 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 um first published by a professor from the university of delaware art metzner in 1957. so basically what he did is he calibrated the impeller as a viscometer so he measured the power for a Newtonian fluid of known viscosity, we know the speed, we know the diameter of the impeller, so we can back out this constant K sub P. Now, if we measure the power draw in a non-Newtonian fluid, knowing the K and the N value, that will give us the apparent viscosity and the shear rate at the impeller. So we've measured KP already for the Newtonian fluid. We're measuring the power, the speed and the diameter, that gives us the apparent viscosity. And if we know the K and the N value from the power law, that gives us the shear rate. So the shear rate at the impeller in laminar flow is proportional to the speed, the rotational speed. And there's a constant of proportionality, lowercase k sub s. And for turbine impellers and hydrofoils propellers, it's a, about 12 to 14. For helical ribbons, which have much more metal, much more drag, the, the, the um, constant's 30. So if I know the K, I know the N, I know the speed at which I need to run, I know the diameter of my impeller, I can calculate quite accurately the power drawn by the impeller to operate at the speed I need to achieve my process result in the laminar regime. So blending in the transitional regime and the laminar regime, so if the Reynolds number is greater than 100 the transition in the transitional or turbulent regimes, the power number is, is more or less constant. But the blend time is proportional to the viscosity. So the blending rate in the vessel is limited by the process at the vessel wall and behind the baffles. So what happens is even though the flow around the impeller is turbulent, the viscosity of the fluid dampens the turbulence so that in the region near the wall and near the surface, the flow is laminar. So we need to know the viscosity at the wall for our non-Newtonian fluid in order to be able to estimate the blend time, because we need the viscosity to get the Reynolds number. So this 
these two movies, uh, I hope, will demonstrate what I just talked about. So this is a pitch blade turbine spinning in a moderately viscous non-Newtonian fluid. And you can see that round the impala, there's, there's reasonably high velocity, there's movement in the top of the tank. But when I add my tracer, it stretches, it folds, it stretches and folds until it's drawn down to the impeller where local turbulence breaks up that, that stream of tracer and mixes it in. So this stretching and folding mechanism is indicative of laminar flow. We stretch, here it comes again, we stretch, we fold until we get down to the impeller where locally there is still some turbulence that hasn't been damped by the viscosity of the fluid. And this is what we're, the, the rate limiting blending step is going to be somewhere in the region where the flow is, is laminar. So let's look at some blend time measurements. These, this, is, this is the dimensionless blend time measured for three individual probes, one underneath the impeller, the second halfway between the shaft and the vessel wall, and one behind the baffle. So in the turbulent regime, high Reynolds numbers, it doesn't matter where you measure. Within the accuracy of the measurements, the blend time is the same. But as we drop down into the uh, transitional regime, the blend time in the bulk of the tank starts to increase slightly. In the region near the wall and behind the baffle, it's inversely proportional to Reynolds number. So the dimensionless blend time in the turbulent regime at the three probes is the same. In the transitional regime, the, the, the deviation between what's happening in the bulk of the tank and at the wall increases as Reynolds number goes down. So what we can assume is that the region in the bulk of the tank is turbulent or transitional and the region near the wall of the tank and near the surface is, is laminar and we're going to use this to develop a model to work out what the shear rate at the wall actually is so the model is called the wall shear stress model so the impala is spinning and it exerts a, a force on the fluid and it has a tip speed v sub tip so there's an equal and opposite force acting on the impeller blades, which results in the torque on the agitator shaft. The fluid is moving uh, tangentially around the tank. And as we get to the wall of the tank, there's a velocity near the wall, which I'm going to call V sub theta. And at some distance away from the wall, I'm, I'm going to have a laminar boundary layer. Some distance moving into the wall, I'm going to have a laminar boundary layer. And it's the shear rate in that boundary layer that I want to identify to use to determine what the apparent viscosity is in this region. So there's a velocity impinging on, on the baffles. And the force on the baffles is proportional to the, the area of the baffles and that velocity squared. There's also frictional forces which relate to the area of the wall and the base of the vessel multiplied by the, the shear stress at the wall. So I can write a force balance that says the force in exerted by the impeller, which is a function of the torque on the shaft, is balanced by the force on the baffles and the force on the wall. So if I can solve this equation, I can get the shear stress at the wall. If I know the shear stress at the wall and the K and the N value, the power law constants for my fluid, I can get the shear rate at the wall. And that's what we're going to do. So writing this in a mathematical form, the torque on the shaft is equal to the viscosity of the fluid times the, sh the shear rate, that gives me the shear stress, plus the pressure drop on the area of the baffles. So if we integrate this equation, and we're gonna make some big assumption that the shear rate at the wall doesn't vary with position, which it, which it does, and that the flow at the wall is laminar, which I think we can safely assume. If we integrate this equation, we get the torque over the tank diameter cubed, or torque per unit volume, is equal to a constant times the shear stress at the wall, times another constant, density of the fluid, width of the baffle squared, 
shear stress at the wall divided by the power law constant k to the two over n. So if we've got baffles in the tank, this equation has to be solved iteratively. If there are no baffles, beta is zero, and we can solve this equation algebraically. So the shear stress at the shear rate at the wall is the shear stress divided by constant k raised to the one over n. And the vis viscosity at the wall is equal to a constant, the consistency of the fluid times the shear rate at the wall raised to the n minus one. So it's it's that simple, simple model, few assumptions we're making. So let's compare some Newtonian and non-Newtonian data. So this is for a pitch blade turbine, one third the tank diameter. The Newtonian measurements are made in tanks of one, two, six, and nine feet in diameter. The colored diamonds are data measured in non-Newtonian fluids Depth vessels of one or 0.3 meters, 0.6 meters, and 1.8 meters. So it's pretty good agreement. This is the same for the uh, um, pitch blade turbine, one half of the tank diameter. But I'm, there's a small amount of data that we've measured with no baffles. So what happens is that this extreme blend time that we're measuring is a result of the dead zone behind the baffles or shadow behind the baffles. If we take the baffles out at a given speed and Reynolds number, the blend time is almost 10 times shorter. So one of the things we can do when we look at the process result is, is ask, well, do you need baffles? Can we take the baffles out? And this is a sign of the benefit that you get if, um, if you do take them out. So going back to the CFD model that we talked about, showed earlier, so John Thomas, who uh, did the um, measurements or did the CFD modeling, he took some data from my PhD thesis. So this is the not, this is the dimensionless mixing time versus Reynolds number for that as the pitch blade turbine, one third the tank diameter, Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids, and the red circles are the predictions that his CFD model makes. So we're capturing the stretching and folding of the laminar process in the top of the tank and the turbulent dispersion near the impeller. And I guess one point that he, he makes here is that this product n times theta is the, is the number of revolutions that the impeller has to make in order to achieve the blend time. So we can pull the um, correlations together for the different types of, these are pitch blade turbines of different diameters. But this correlation also works at other types of hydrofoils and other types of turbines. So we're plotting a dimensionless group called the Fourier number, which takes account of blend time, physical properties, and the vessel scale. This is the process result. And power number to the third times Reynolds number on the x-axis takes account of the physical properties, the impeller type, and the diameter and speed. So this region, we're in the turbulent regime. This region, we're in the um, transitional regime. And this correlation holds provided that the Fourier number is less than one and that the power number to third times Reynolds number is greater than 184. So if I know the K and the N value for your fluid, if I know the size of the tank, if I know your desired blend time, I can size a mixer that will achieve that process result and this is the, the this is the method i'll use to size that mixer that piece of equipment so let's move on and talk about fluids with a much more difficult rheology and those are fluids with a yield stress so a, fl a fluid with a yield stress you have to exert a minimum force on the fluid before it will move deform so if you think about I've got a, a, a steel wire and I apply a weight to it, the wire will stretch. And if I take the weight off, it will recover to its original length. Unless I put so much weight on it, I exceed its yield stress and it will permanently deform, stretch. So the same idea is true for fluids. The fluids won't move until I exceed the yield stress. So when I measure the rheology with my viscometer, the yield stress will appear as an intercept on the y-axis, on the shear stress axis. If the fluid's not moving, I can't have a shear rate because the shear rate is, is a velocity gradient, no velocity, no velocity gradient. 
This is the force I must exert on the fluid before it's going to move. So what does a fluid with a yield stress look like? What does it feel like? Well, we see these every day in our kitchens. So this is a slurry that was sent to our lab to test. We run the spatula through the surface. And it's the, the fluid, it's a fluid, it sits on the spatula and we have a trough at the surface, which is pretty permanent. So the, the, what this is telling us is that the force of gravity is not sufficient to overcome the yield stress and, and flatten the surface, which if it was water or, or low viscosity fluid, what would happen immediately? Uh, so peanut butter, mayonnaise, margarine, you know, lots of materials that we have in our kitchen behave in exactly the same way. They are non-Newtonian, they have rheology, they have yield stresses. So we're modeling the rheology. We've talked, I've talked about the power law and how we fit it to the data. This is true also of the Herschel Bulkley model and the Bingham plastic model that we use to take into account yield stresses. No physical basis. So you can model a yield stress fluid as a shear thinning fluid with a, a low N uh, index, or a shear thinning fluid as a yield stress fluid with a low, a low yield stress. But ultimately, we need to design mixes that work. And the yield stress model allows us to do this. This is a kind of philosophical argument. Who cares? We're engineers. We need to design mixes that work. And, and this approach allows us to do that. So to give you an example, this is the rheology of corn stover. So there's a lot of interest in developing ethanol methods to produce ethanol from cellulosic materials, corn stover being one of them. So this is the apparent viscosity versus shear rate for uh, corn stover at four concentrations. And obviously, as the concentration goes up, the uh, viscosity goes up. So the important thing to notice about this chart is we've got six log cycles on the y-axis versus two log cycles on the x-axis. The gradient here is, is very, very steep and very uh, negative. Or in shear stress terms, the N value is less than one, less than 0.1. So the, these gradients are essentially minus one. All the resistance to motion comes from the yield stress of the fluid. So what these folks did, Piminova and Hanley, was they fitted their data to the power law. This is the constant, K. This is the index N. So what I've done is I have calculated the value of the shear stress over a range of shear rates. So what I'm calling data here are actually calculated values using that K and N value. And then I fitted the Herschel Bulkley model to the data. And I can fit it with a yield stress of 45 pascals. The K value goes down, the N value goes up. So that's what happens if I if I measure the rheology, excuse me, and the N value is less than 0.1. I'm certainly going to look at it and see if I can fit the same set of data to a, a yield stress model. And in this case, I can. So there's a couple of things we have to be careful about. The first is that we need to, that what the, the, the yield stress is something that we detect at low shear rates. So this is a measurement of shear stress versus shear rate for a slurry. So when you measure slurries, you have to make sure that the solids are kept in suspension. So there's a minimum shear rate at which we can operate our viscometer or our mixer before the solids start to settle out. And I can fit a power law model and I can fit a Bingham plastic model. Bingham plastic model says the yield stress is nearly 300 pascals. Power law model says the N value is 0.16. When I extrapolate, and I look at what the viscosity predicted is at the low, a low shear rate of 0.1 reciprocal seconds. The Bingham plastic says it's nearly 3 million centipoise. The power law says it's nearly 2 million centipoise. So which one do I use? A conservative design is going to say treat it as a Bingham plastic, but that's going to cost me a lot more in terms of metal, shaft diameter, gearbox size and power. So 
maybe I should do a bit more studying to see which of these models, see if I can actually get some models at lower shear rates. Now, this is an example of um, shear stress versus shear rate measured by a customer. Um, the, 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 they have a viscometer that allows them to measure the rheology at the temperature and the pressure of the process. So what we're looking for if we have a yield stress fluid is an asymptote. This asymptote is the yield stress of the fluid. Um, if, this, if these red circles continue downwards, that would be a simple power law fluid. So we can plot the apparent viscosity versus the um, shear rate. The yield stress is 330 pascals, which means that we you can almost walk on this stuff. But the apparent, we can calculate the apparent viscosity if we know the shear rate of our agitator and size our equipment to mix this tank. And that's what we did. We basically used these measurements to size our, our mixer. No, no tests, um, size the mixer, mixer was installed and the customer was, was really happy with its performance. So need to make measurements that actually identify the yield stress of the fluid. Make measurements at the lowest shear rate that you possibly can to look for that asymptote behavior. So what does a yield stress look like in a stirred tank? So this picture was made by a guy called Tim Elson using X-ray photography. So he's got X-ray film behind the tank, an X-ray camera in front of the tank, turns the mixer on, lets it run for a little while to come to some equilibrium steady state of flow, and then takes a picture. Then he increases the speed, waits, takes another picture. So we have this region where the fluid is in motion, these streaks, the, the fluid is seeded with little metal particles. And where we see the streaks, the fluid is moving. Where we see the dots, it's not moving. And you can just see the impeller blades in, inside what in the mixing world is called a cavern. Inside the cavern is moving, outside is stagnant. So what does this stagnation cause? It leads to fouling, reduction in operating volume, plugging of inlets and outlets, poor incorporation of feeds on the surface, insulation of heat transfer surface surfaces, uh, and all sorts of other issues. So what is the design rule? The minimum size of the zone in motion, the cavern, is the swept volume of the impeller. In this particular case, if we treat the, um, the cavern as a cylinder, we can draw the outline of, of the cavern. So our minimum design rule is that the cavern reaches the wall of the tank. And, and that's, that's how we're gonna use the measurements of yield stress to, to size our, our impeller and choose the speed. This is another set of data uh, of some pictures you made using a technique called laser Doppler anemometry. So where we have black circles, the tangential velocity of the fluid is at least 1% of the tip speed. And as we increase the speed from 1. Point, well, let's call that 66 revs per minute to 200 revs per minute, the zone in motion reaches out to the wall of the tank. And once the fluid reaches the wall, it starts to grow, the, the cavern starts to grow up and down the wall, above and below the level of the impeller. And where we see the crosses, these are regions where we're starting to develop axial flow, the classic axial flow that we would see with a, a Rushton turbine, flow coming in from above, flow coming in from underneath as well. So how are we going to size our mixer? So Tim Elson proposed a model called the cavern model. DC is the diameter of the cavern. D is the diameter of the impeller. Now we're defining a Reynolds number in terms of the yield stress of the fluid. So we have to add another speed, speed squared, diameter squared up here to keep it dimensionally consistent. So we can take out this equation. We can set the diameter of the cavern equal to the diameter of the tank, expand and solve. And that tells us for a given impeller, power number, a given diameter of impeller, and a given yield stress, how fast we must spin the mixer for the cavern to reach the wall of the tank. So that's my minimum design. And generally what we're going to do 
is choose a larger diameter, maybe half or greater of the, of the tank diameter, larger power number, because that reduces the speed and reduces the power input in general. So once the cavern reaches the wall, it grows. So this N, this speed is great, this ratio is greater than one. And we can predict the height of the cavern because the ratio for each of the impellers has also been measured by Elson. So for radial flow impellers that are pumping out towards the wall of the tank, that ratio is about half. When we have axial flow impellers which are pumping downwards, that ratio is, is larger. So we want the cavern to fill the wall of the, fill the volume of the tank. So what's how can we achieve that? So one way is to increase the speed until the cavern fills the volume. And that equation tells us that to double the height of the cavern, we have to double the speed. So in the turbulent regime, and often the inside of the cavern becomes turbulent once we've overcome the yield stress, the power is proportional to the speed cubed. So we need eight times the power. So what are we going to do? We're simply going to size our agitator for the cavern to reach the wall of the tank, calculate the height of the cavern, and then stack enough caverns in the tank, add more impellers, so that um, essentially we double the height of the cavern with um, by doubling the power. Now, one thing you've got to be very careful about here is what is the minimum level at which you're going to operate? Because if you're planning to fully empty the tank, you need to have an impeller down near the base of the vessel. Because as soon as the, um, in the liquid level drops below the lowest impeller, mixing stops, the yield stress takes over and you won't be able to empty the tank. You need to have mixing below or an impeller position below the minimum level that you expect to be operating in your tank. Back to that discussion of the process result. So this movie on the left is a scaled down version of a customer's agitator. They changed the recipe in their process um, and found they, all sorts of terrible fouling, no mixing happening, nothing happening on the surface. This movie on the right is a scaled down of our, of our proposal. And I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let this run, let them both run a little longer. So here we go, starting up. So what happens? We have to grab the, the container to stop it rotating. The force exerted on the fluid by the impeller is transferred to the wall of the tank. There's, there's movement at the wall of the tank. For the scale down of the customer's existing agitator, it's not working. So measure the yield stress, choose the appropriate impeller, choose the speed. We need motion at the wall of the tank. So I'll say a few words now about uh, counterflow impeller. So the helical ribbon is, has been commonly used for laminar mixing, but it's heavy, it's complicated to build and install, and we need accurate vessel roundness because it has a close clearance, the distance between the edge of the ribbon and the wall. So there are other impellers sold for laminar mixing that in, include anchors. But the problem with anchors is they don't generate axial motion. I've said this earlier, no top to bottom flow. The fluid just moves around the vessel, solid body rotation, nothing's happening. So Philadelphia Mixer Solutions sell an impeller we call the counterflow. Lightning sell one they call the A620. So these are pictures. This is the Philly counterflow. This is the Lightning A620. So we've got a, a flight in the middle, a blade in the middle that pumps downwards. We've got a blade near the tip, near the wall of the tank that pumps upwards. And what we're going to do is we're going to put multiple impellers on the shaft and the number of impellers and their spacing and the diameter of the impeller relative to the tank is going to depend on how viscous the fluid is and how non-Newtonian it is. So this is a, an agitator that was supplied for a high yield stress of slurry, has a 30 horsepower motor, low rotational speed, and the diameter of each of these impellers is 320 inches. And we'll come back and talk a bit more about this um, in, in a minute. 
So what are the attributes of these impellers? They're generally supplied with a large impeller to tank diameter ratio. They have a high shear zone where the up and down pumping blades meet. So we've got a large velocity gradient. So if we actually want to disperse a solid into a viscous liquid, these impellers actually work. We, we've done this and we've supplied impellers to customers who, who are adding solids to viscous liquids. And that in itself drives up the viscosity and drives up the yield stress. So in our lab, we've currently tested um, counterflows with viscosities up to 2 million centipoise, Reynolds numbers less than 0.1, creeping flow, and yield stresses in the range of hundreds of pascals. Um, we have good design rules successfully tested them. The other example, the benefit of these in powers, because they have a low projected height, they have a low power number. So in order to input the power to the fluid, they run at a higher speed than a helical ribbon would or an anchor. Because they run at a higher speed, they have a higher shear rate, and the apparent viscosity that the impeller feels as it rotates in that fluid is lower, which increases the mixing rate and reduces the power draw. So they, they have a lot of attributes, a lot of benefits in terms of um, uh, their performance in these systems. So one of the questions that's often answered, asked or specifications that um, is given is that we need a certain blend time. So we've measured blend times with counterflow impellers in unbaffled vessels. So we need an estimate of the viscosity of the fluid we can't at the impact, not at the impeller, at the wall. So we're going to use this wall shear stress model in order to, to do that. We can't use Metronotto because it only tells us the shear rate at the impeller. So this is our correlation. This is the Fourier number that I mentioned earlier, which has the blend time and the scale of the vessel. Power number to the third times Reynolds number and the impeller to tank diameter ratio. So there's a bit of scatter in this data. And one of the things that happened here, we tried to measure the blend time using conductivity. And what we think happened is we were getting boundary layer effects around our conductivity probes. So there's a lot of scatter. We can see the cause and effect. We can make a good estimate of the blend time um, given fluid properties, impeller type, dia well, counterflow diameter, tank diameter. But We'd like to redo these experiments using a uh, technique that's not intrusive to, to measure the blend time. Uh, so this is, a, this is a, a counterflow impeller as we would um, install it, multiple impellers on the shaft. Uh, again, this is the one foot diameter tank. The impeller to tank diameter ratio is uh, almost one. We're operating at 180 RPM and we're just gonna stop the impeller just to add the tracer. And what you see is uh, there's there's movement throughout the tank. The, bead, the red beads are moving everywhere. There's a, there are seams along the wall where the beads collect, but they're in motion. And there's you'll, as you see the color change, you'll see that the, the, the dye doesn't form a seam. You'll see these striations, which are classic indications of laminar flow, stretching and folding. But you can see that the color's changing and the color is changing past the, where the beads are sitting. There, there are the striations starting to appear. But we're gradually moving that tracer down to the bottom of the tank. The, the bottom of the tank is slowly becoming clear, but everywhere you look, the beads are in motion. So in this movie, we've got the beads uh, sitting at the surface. Uh, I'm, I want to show you this to compare with a computer model that we, we developed. So you can see the, the pulsing on the surface as the blade passes, and you can see the beads being pulled down the center of the shaft and pushed out towards the wall of the tank. So this is a computer model. This is the so the customer who bought the agitator with the 320 inch diameter counterflows had some problems. They, they were operating, the plant, operating a plant in a way that was different to 
the way they describe it to us, which led to some some issues with fouling. Um, the impellers are now 30 feet, 360 inches in diameter. There's four of them instead of three. So what the purpose of this computer model is that under normal condition, operating conditions, the liquid surface is located at this coupling. So what the customer wanted to know is if our downstream equipment has to shut down and we have to use this tank as a buffer and the level goes up, will it still be able to mix? So we did the computer model. This is computational fluid dynamics using a technique called large eddy simulation. Um, and you can see the beads at the bottom are picked up very quickly because they're close to, to an impeller. You can see the pulsing on the surface as the impeller passes. And gradually, especially in the bottom right hand movie, you can start to see the, the, the traces, the massless particles being pulled down, exactly as we saw in the movie. So the customer, our answer to the customer was, yes, you can still mix the tank when the level rises up to um, that one you've specified, your, your high, high level, and the tank will still mix. Which is obviously, obviously reassuring to them. And um, this is a picture of a 360 inch diameter counterflow with four of the people who were fitting it together at in the manufacturer's workshop. Um, and I, I always look at this picture and, uh, I, well, I, I'm very impressed. I hope you guys are all impressed, all impressed too. So this mix has started up in the spring of 2019. It's, it's worked fine, no complaints. Um, every, everything from a process point of view is um, working fine. But the, again, the message is it's hard to anticipate potential process changes. Hindsight's always a wonderful thing, but we were able to solve the customers' problems that resulted from the change in the way they, they um, were pro doing their process by making rheological measurements, doing some small lab scale tests and through the CFD model. So here are my conclusions. We need a good definition of the process result. It doesn't matter what you're mixing. We always need a good definition of the process result, a, a good discussion about um, what you want the mixer to achieve. We need good basic data. And in this particular case, accurate measurements of rheological behavior. If we have that, we're going to use the Metzner and, Otto, Metzner and Otto method to estimate the viscosity for power consumption in the laminar regime. We're going to use the wall shear stress model to estimate the viscosity for blend time in the transition and the laminar regimes. And we're going to use the Cavan model to estimate the minimum speed of the agitator for yield stress fluids. But we again, we need good measurement, especially at, at low shear rates. And finally, the counterflow impellers are very versatile. They can operate from turbulent to laminar processes. And we've certainly used them in processes where the viscosity changes, going from low viscosity turbulent flow to laminar processes, like a, a condensation polymerization, for example. And they're demonstrated to be very suitable alternatives to helical ribbons. So this ends the, pr the presentation. I'm now going to begin to answer your questions so uh, I'll take a look at the list and we'll start from the top. There are a few questions posted in the question and answer section and I'll go through these one by one. So the first one is, how do these rules apply to high concentration slurries? Well, the, basically the rules uh, apply to any fluid which you can measure, for which you can measure viscosity or rheology. So low concentration slurries, the viscosity that the impeller feels as it moves through the, the two-phase mixture is the viscosity of the liquid. 
as the solid's concentration goes up and the particle-particle interaction, the particle-particle friction increases, the force that the impeller has to impart to the fluid to make it move, to the slurry to make it move, increases as well. And that increase in force is essentially a result of the increasing apparent viscosity of the slurry. So if you can measure viscosity for or rheology for a slurry, then the rules that we've talked about where you've got a set of constants, the power law consistency, the power law index, and the yield stress, those same rules apply. Um, and we, we do it many times. We, we're often selling equipment to companies that are uh, processing you know, solids, solids concentrations, 60% by weight. Um, in some cases, you know, especially when you've got organic solids and organic liquids, there's very little density difference and a 40 or 50% by weight slurry will be 40 or 50% by volume also. So yes, the answer is these rules do apply to high, high concentration slurries. Uh, how big can a helical ribbon be made? Uh, I've seen them 10 feet in diameter. Um, this was in a polymer plant uh, that where the polymer is being used to spin fibers. So one side of a wall, you've got the chemical plant that's making the polymer. The other side of the wall, you've got the spinning machines that are spinning the fiber. So you, you need to have a sort of wide spot in the line to homogenize small variations in the quality of the or the composition of the polymer that's coming from the chemical side. So in this particular example, the, the tank had a residence time of about 24 hours. So it was a big tank, large diameter helical ribbon, and off the top of my head, it was about 10, 10 feet in diameter. Uh, another question, can this design procedure be used to determine if an existing agitator and vessel can be used for a new process with a viscous non-Newtonian fluid? Uh, the answer is yes, and this is a general answer to um, whether it's viscous non-Newtonian or, or low viscosity. The um, many chemical plants, you've got vessels, you've got react, uh, agitators, you've got in equipment, in investment in equipment, and you would like to reuse that equipment rather than buy new equipment for uh, a, a new process. So the answer is yes. If you can, you can calculate the torque, the power and the torque, you know, the power number of your impeller, the number of impellers, the speed, you can calculate the Reynolds number, and you can then determine whether or not that agitator is going to be suitable for a new fluid, whether it's low viscosity, high viscosity, and or non-Newtonian in, in, in some, res some respect. Um, another question, is there any difference in calculating K and N using a common Brookfield viscometer instead of a rheometer or Couette viscometer that you use? Um, the answer is no. So Brookfield viscometers, the 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 um the bobs, the rotating part. If you look in the catalog, some of them have a a constant, a quantity, a, a constant called the shear rate constant, SRC, that is listed. So if you have the SRC for the bob that you're using, you can then convert the rotational speed of the, the of the bob as it spins in in the the, the liquid to a shear rate. But in order to get the K and the N value, you have to be measuring the shear stress as a function of shear rate. Some Brookfield viscometers and some other viscometers as well only give you the viscosity versus speed. You need to be able to convert the speed to a shear rate. Um, if you if you use different viscometer types, um, so there's the, the Couet viscometer, there's cone and plate viscometers, even a capillary viscometer where you measure the pressure drop as, as you pump a fluid down a, a, a small diameter pipe. You, if, if you're 
defining the shear rate correctly, you should get the same K and N values, independent of the type of viscometer that you use. Um, can you advise on how to make viscosity measurements? Well, I think we talked a little bit about that in, in the webinar. Take your sample. The, well, the first thing to say is you've got to measure over the range of shear rates that you expect to see in the device that you're designing. So mi <coughs> mixers, we typically measure zero to 50 reciprocal seconds. If you're designing a pump, pipe, pipe flow, the shear rates are going to be made in the range of hundreds of reciprocal seconds. If you're designing a spray nozzle to spray paint, the shear rate in a spray nozzle is going to be the order of thousands of reciprocal seconds. So you need to measure the shear stress over the range of shear rates that you expect to see in the device that you're, you're designing and planning to build. The reason for this is, as I think I said, the, the fits of the data are simply fits, like they're best fit correlations. There's no underlying physics behind them. And it's very dangerous to extrapolate. So if we're measuring over, you know, let's say in our lab, we're measuring from zero to 50 for a mixer design, it's dangerous to then take the K and the N value that you extract from the regression of the data to size a pump. You don't know what the fluid's going to be doing, how it's going to be behaving at higher shear rates. Um, you put the fluid in the, in the viscometer, you put the bob in, um, and you measure the shear stress over a range of shear rates, um, ramp up. And, and uh, one thing that we, feel quite strongly is, is is a useful technique is to ramp the speed up and down again to look for hysteresis. Does Has your fluid built structure that needs to be um, broken before the fluid will flow and potentially even ramp up a second time and down a second time to again see how how much that structure is broken over time. Um, I think if, you, if that doesn't, um, feel free to drop me an email if you if that doesn't answer the question. I, I think it might, might have been a bit vague. Um, what would be the ideal mixing strategy for large concrete tanks of shear thinning fluids using multiple mixers? Well, the, we talked a bit about the cavern model for shear thinning fluid, uh, for yield stress fluids. Um, I would look at putting positioning mixes so that they create a cavern, whether it's a true yield stress fluid or shear thinning fluid, so and position the mixer so that the caverns intersect and also that the caverns reach out to the corner of the tanks. Um, this is typically, you know, large concrete tanks, wastewater industry, maybe it's um, anaerobic digestion or so, you know, um, solids handling. Uh, upstream or downstream of, of the pro, of the water treatment plant. But that's how I would look at it. In, have the caverns intersect, position the mixers, size the mixers so that the fluid is moving, position the mixers so that the caverns intersect. Um, in mixing applications, have I come across an agitator that was heated? Um, I don't, good question. I don't think that I have. Um, I think I can understand why this this question is being asked. If you if you um, if you're mixing a non-Newtonian fluid and you have build up on the shaft and the and the blades, um, I don't think I have the but I mean the 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 shaft. I, I think build up on the shaft and the blades would probably be due more to low shear rates and high apparent viscosities in that location rather than rather than a, a temperature issue, because the sh the temperature of the shaft and the impeller, as impellers, if it's multiple impellers, are going to be um, equal to the temperature of the liquid. So um, again, I if I if I haven't answered your question, absolutely feel free to drop me an email and anyone else whose question I haven't got to uh, right now, 
also please if something comes up if you have any questions please feel free to drop me an email it's richard.grenville at spxflow.com so um thanks for your time and uh as i said th um, if you want to reach out to have any questions please let me know uh, again thanks for your time